Hi, everyone. I apologize. My calendar showed 2.15, so uh, I, I'm here. Hello. Okay, we're about to go live. Yeah. Sorry. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Spring 2021 CEO panel presented by the Lewis College of Business and its Brad D. Smith Schools of Business at Marshall University. I'm Avi Mukherjee, Dean of the Lewis College of Business. Thank you speakers and panelists, students, alumni, faculty, staff, community members, business leaders, government officials, university administrators, and board members for joining us on this webinar today. The Lewis College of Business, celebrating its 50th anniversary, offers contemporary cutting edge and applied business education and research while being rooted in the region's economic and business development. Reimagined by a transformational gift by Brad and Elise Smith in 2018, the Brad D. Smith Schools of Business have identified experiential learning as the DNA of our academic programs in business. The Dean's Distinguished Speaker Series was started in 2018 as the highest profile community event of the Brad D. Smith Schools of Business with support from President Jerry Gilbert, Provost Jaime Taylor, Foundation CEO Ron Area and others, offering a rich and vibrant experience to our students and various other stakeholders as they learn from renowned C-suite executives, entrepreneurs, intrapreneurs, and industry leaders about business successes, effective leadership, and the future of work. As a part of this series, the CEO panel put together by Brad Smith and his team at Intuit brings globally recognized top tier business leaders to provide insightful perspectives through dynamic discussions, covering a broad range of topics that influence the world of business and draw powerful lessons from the boardroom to the classroom. You might remember our highly successful first CEO panel in spring 2020, held on February 19 at the historic and majestic Keith Albee Performing Arts Center in Huntington, with Brad Smith joined by Shantanu Narayan, Chairman, President and CEO of Adobe, and Daniel Shulman, President and CEO of PayPal. And the second CEO panel in fall 2020, held via Zoom on October 21, with Brad Smith joined by Jeff Wiener, Executive Chairman and former CEO of LinkedIn. Today, we are hosting the third CEO panel in this series, where Brad Smith will engage in an amazing fireside chat with Shelley Archambault and Chris Gardner, who will be introduced soon. The stories of overcoming insurmountable odds, shattering glass ceilings, and investing in the next generation are simply awe-inspiring. The theme for this panel is creating success on your own terms. Talent is dispersed equally, but opportunity is not. Rapid technological, environmental, and societal shifts are driving the lack of economic opportunity in communities across the globe. The current health and economic crisis are speeding up these shifts even more. In this fireside chat, Marshall students and local community leaders will hear from three leaders in tech to discuss the skills and mindsets needed to lead and succeed in today's landscape. The goal of this fireside chat is to provide insight and inspiration for the audience and further encourage them to apply their talent and energy to pursue their passion and create opportunities for themselves and their communities. There will be a question and answer session at the end by Dr. Nancy Langton, our Associate Dean for Accreditation and Strategic Initiatives. Together, communities, corporations, and academia can shape the world for future generations to thrive. Thank you for supporting the Distinguished Speaker Series at Marshall University as we strive to create impact, innovation, and engagement for business and business education in our mountain state. It is now my honor to introduce Mr. Patrick Farrell, the chairman of the Marshall University Board of Governors. Thank you, Avi, and welcome to everybody joining online. It's my honor to introduce our moderator today, Brad from Canova. For most of you, that'd be enough. You all know Brad Smith. You know he's a West Virginia native. You know that he graduated from Marshall University. You know that he's a titan in the business world. And you know he's a man that's driven to give back to the people and communities that have made him successful along the way. For those of you that don't know Brad and his superhero origin story, let me share with you a little bit about it. Brad indeed grew up in Canova, West Virginia, which is just miles from the Marshall campus. He graduated and went to work for Pepsi. Along the way, he got a master's degree from Aquinas College in Michigan and worked at places like 7up and ADP before, before finding his way to Intuit. When he got to Intuit, it didn't take long for them to figure out that they captured lightning in the bottle with Brad. He quickly moved up the corporate ladder and for 11 years served as their CEO. While at the helm, 
Brad led a business transformation that took a desktop software company and transformed it into a cloud-based uh, platform company that spanned the globe. Brad built a team that based their decisions on data-driven information, on uh, rapid experimentation, and used his mission-driven and customer-centered obsession to drive revenues up by two, twofold, and their stock price up by 500%. Brad recently stepped back as CEO and now serves as the executive chairman of Intuit, of their board of directors. He also serves on the board of directors of Nordstrom as their chairman and on the board of SurveyMonkey. But Brad really decided after all of that, that conquering the business world wasn't all that he was gonna do. He wasn't gonna be a one trick pony. And so in partnership with his wife, Elise, they founded the Wing to Wing Foundation, a foundation that strives to advance education, entrepreneurship, and equality in communities that have been underserved and overlooked for too long. I can tell you a lot about Brad, all right? But I'm gonna leave you with three things. One, he's a very generous benefactor. I'm speaking to you today from the Brad D. Smith Foundation Hall here on Marshall's campus. Just down the road, it's a site where we're gonna build a business school to house the Brad D. Smith Schools of Business. And many institutions around the state have benefited from Brad's generosity. Brad's also an inspirational leader. He's been a role model to me to show me how he can take his experience and translate that to help unleash the human potential that we all have. Finally, you'll find no bigger enthusiastic supporter of Marshall in West Virginia than Brad Smith. It really is my honor to introduce to you one of Marshall's most outstanding graduates, a true son of Marshall, Brad from Canova. Oh my goodness, Patrick. Thank you for that unbelievably generous and kind introduction. I hope my mom is watching this somewhere. <laughs> I have to say everyone, it is a privilege to have the opportunity to speak with you again and to host the third CEO panel in this continuing distinguished speaker series for Marshall University. As Dean Avi so aptly described, this series is designed to host leaders from the, some of the most forward leaning companies, as well as the most strategic leadership positions to share their global insights and to answer questions with your local perspective included. It's hard to believe that this series began just one year ago at the historic Keith Alvey Theater. And as Dean Avi described, we benefited from the wisdom and the best practices of Dan Schulman, the CEO of PayPal, Shantanu Narayan, the chairman and CEO of Adobe, and even a special video guest appearance from John Donahoe, the CEO of Nike. And then when the pandemic hit, we didn't stop. We moved to a Zoom environment and we hosted the amazing Jeff Weiner, the former CEO and current executive chairman of LinkedIn and the founder of Next Play Ventures, a venture capital firm. And through this last 12 months, each of us have endured severe weather events, the pandemic, social inequity, racial injustice, some political turmoil and economic upheaval. And we're not even out of the woods yet, but we are still standing. And that is a testament to the statement that if bad times are followed by good reflections, you can create amazing opportunity. And that's what today's event is all about. It is my privilege to host two of the most forward leaning leaders and role models in life that I've had the pleasure of getting to know and becoming friends with. They exemplify what it means to dream big to actually overcome insurmountable obstacles or seemingly insurmountable obstacles. They have the ability to break glass ceilings. And most importantly, they inspire through their example, the best in others. They do it with dignity and with grace. Now, the way our panel is structured today is I'm going to introduce each of our guest panelists one at a time. I'll ask them to share some opening comments and then we'll bring them both together where we will have a fireside chat and we will also take questions from those of you in the viewing audience. So you, if you have questions for either of our guests or myself, just simply submit them in the Q&A function in Zoom. And when we get to that portion of today's session, we'll take your questions. But without further ado, it is my privilege to introduce our first guest panelist, Ms. Shelley Archambault. Shelley was the former CEO of Metric Stream. She's someone that Reid Hoffman, the, co -found, the founder of LinkedIn and the partner at Greylock Ventures right now, a venture capital firm in the Silicon Valley, described as the woman who led the greatest turnaround in Silicon Valley history, 
that you may have never heard of. Now, Shelly serves on the board of Nordstrom with me. She's also on the board of Verizon, Roper Technologies, and Okta. She is also an advisor to the Royal Bank of Canada, to Capital Markets, to Forbes Ignite, and to CEOs of startups. She's regularly on the list of the who's who in technology. She's the central character in a Harvard Business School case study called Becoming a CEO. And most recently, she's the author of the best-selling book, Unapologetically Ambitious, Take Risks, Break Barriers, and Create Success on Your Own Terms. Now, in her spare time, if there's such a thing in Shelley's world, Shelley also hosts a gourmet dinner club, and she writes a blog where she shares advice about her career, about insights, and other musings. And if you want to check out her blog, it is at Shelly.com. That's S-H-E-L-L-Y-E.com. But without further ado, it is my privilege to introduce to you my dear friend, Ms. Shelly Archambault. Thank you very much, Brad, for that very gracious and generous introduction. I have really been looking forward to this event. So thank you so much for having me. So Brad just shared with you a lot of accomplishments that I've had. But I have to tell you, I had no business accomplishing those things. None. I mean, I, when I was little and tiny, you know, a little girl, and you think back those decades and decades ago, you wouldn't have seen who you see today. I was born to a family where my father didn't have a college degree. Mom was a stay-at-home mom, had four kids in less than five years. Money was so tight, mom made all of our clothing. Um, she, you know, going out to dinner. I didn't do my first real restaurant until I was in high school. All right. And so here I am, my family is living in Philadelphia. I'm six years old and we move over Christmas of all times to California because dad has a new opportunity. Okay. Except we moved to a suburb of LA and this is the sixties. The sixties is a racially charged time for as many people that wanted civil rights and equal rights. You had just as many that didn't. And we moved into a neighborhood where I was the only black girl, not just in my class, not just in my grade, but I think in the school. So people made it very clear to me at that very young age that they didn't really want me around. You know, I suffered from frankly, a lot of verbal abuse, physical abuse. I had to walk along this really busy road to get to school every day. And people, which means adults, would yell horrific things at me out their window, call me awful names, right? Tell me to go back where I came from, go to the jungle, head back to Africa, all these things. I'm six and seven years old, it's tiny. I was beat up by kids on walking home from school that I knew that were in my class. I mean, it was just not good. So the fact that I could actually rise up to achieve some of those things that Brad talked about, no, that wasn't in my head at all at those ages but I was really fortunate, really fortunate in that I had a parents that were determined to try to help counter a lot of that. So when you come home as a kid and things happen to you, people push you down, right? Or hurt you or call you names, et cetera. You come home and you complain, you say, it's not fair, right? It's not fair. And instead of my mom just hugging me and saying, oh, better next time, so sorry, et cetera. No, I mean, she'd still hug me, but she'd say, Shelly, life's not fair. What? Life should be fair. You get one, I get one, it should be fair. No, life's not fair. So you need to decide what you're going to do about that. Okay. And then the other big lesson she taught me was no matter what people say to you or what they do to you, you can control how you respond. So don't let them win. And letting them win meant don't let them influence how you feel about yourself. Okay, easy to be taught that as a kid, takes a little bit to learn along the way. And trust me, it was hard, but I was really fortunate. I had a couple of teachers that took an interest in me. So I took this shy girl who at the time gangly, I was too tall and too thin and didn't fit in all those things um, and started to build a little bit of courage and confidence, if you will, in me. And then I learned because I wanted so much just to be accepted, for people to actually respect me and see that there was good in me, that I would try to offer to help people and do things to have them get to know me 
right? In a way. And I learned over time that actually being helpful to people is a great way for them to actually build a relationship with you and see past the stereotypes, right? And or biases they might have. And I also learned in helping and working with people and things that I actually was pretty good at organizing things. And that if I actually did that, people would look to me from a leadership standpoint. And when they did, it actually meant I could better control my environment. I could determine what I did and who I was engaging with, et cetera, to really protect myself. So I grew into a leader, right, of sorts by doing that. And I learned that by getting involved in clubs and organizations, that was a great outlet for me. Well, I got lucky. I had a phenomenal guidance counselor in high school who asked me that obligatory junior year conversation, do you want to go to college and what do you want to do after that? And I told her, I don't know what I want to do, but I definitely want to go to college because of my family, get good grades, go to your best university and get a job. And that's kind of where it ended. So I'm like, I want a job. And so she said, what do you like to do? I said, clubs, organizations, I'm in everything. I like to lead them, et cetera. And she said, you know, business is just like clubs, pull people together to get something accomplished to a common vision. And I was like, great, I wanna run a business. And when I looked around, the people that run businesses are called CEOs. So I said, I wanna be a CEO. Did I know what that meant? No, I had no clue what that really meant. I picked it because she said it's like running a club. So, okay, I'm president of the French club. I can be CEO of a company, right? Well, what it did for me was it gave me a goal. And I'm a pretty goal-oriented person. So I said, all right, I've now got this goal. So how do I achieve the goal? And literally, the process I've used my whole life is I ask myself, what am I trying to do? I want to be a CEO. Okay, what has to be true for me to achieve it? which means I have to go do the work, the research, understand what has to be true. What kind of degrees did they get? What companies did they join? All those kinds of things. And then the next question is, how do I make it true? Which is basically the plan. So that's what I did. And what that enabled me to do, the shy, gangly girl who didn't have a lot of confidence early on, is it allowed me to improve my odds to actually get what I want. Because the odds, the odds weren't in my favor. When I looked up 16 CEOs, there was no internet, so you can only look at who was in the paper or magazines. And guess what? Not a single one looked like me. No females that I see or people who are black. So are odds in my favor? No. And then I wasn't getting a ton of encouragement either. You want to be a CEO? Isn't that nice? <laughs> right? I mean, it was. But I determined I was going to do it. And bottom line, I joined IBM. But that is the plan. I rose through the ranks. I became one of the youngest um, executives ever named at IBM. I was the first African-American female sent as an executive overseas to run a multi-billion dollar division. And then ultimately worked my way to Silicon Valley where I became one of the first black female CEOs. So what that tells you is you can improve your odds to get what it is you want. As long as you're intentional, you're willing to do the work. And oh, by the way, you take a lot of help, get help. Life is hard. Nobody achieves all this stuff by themselves. We all had help and support along the way. So it is not a weakness to ask for help. It is actually a strength. And fortunately, I was able to find people to help me and support me every step of the way. And listen, I'm here to tell you that if I could do it, that Shelly Archambault, that little girl I told you about, if she could become a CEO and a Fortune 500 board member, so can you. You can achieve whatever aspiration you have for yourself. I'm fully confident of the fact. Plus, you're halfway there. You're at Marshall University. You're at one of the greatest institutions out there. You've got a whole host of support from the professors, from the alumni. So take advantage of those resources around you. Take help, get guidance, get support, and then go out there and achieve what it is you want. You don't have to be CEO. Whatever it is that you want for your life, professionally and personally, go after it unapologetically because everybody has the right to be ambitious and achieve their aspirations. Thank you. Wow. Wow, Shelly. I can only say to the audience, you now know why she is one of my closest personal friends and confidants. We have been mentored by the same people in the Silicon Valley. We serve on similar boards and we also stay in contact on a regular basis. And it's because she's such an inspiration to all around her. And I look forward to hearing more from you, Shelly, 
in the fireside chat. But at this moment, it's my privilege to introduce a second equally amazing panelist. Now they say that a picture paints a thousand words. If that is the case, then a moving picture, a movie has a chance to change your life. Or at least that's what this movie did for me. Please roll the clip. I met my father for the first time when I was 28 years old. When I had children, my children were gonna know who their father was. Yeah. Chris Gardner was doing his best. We don't need two. We don't need one. Maybe next quarter. It's possible. But his best hey! Wait! wasn't enough. Man, I got two questions for you. What do you do and how do you do it? I'm a stockbroker. Stockbroker. Oh. Hey, I'm gonna let you hang on to my car for the weekend, but I need it back for Monday. Feed the meter. <laughs> I need the rent. I can't wait anymore. I need you out of here in the morning. You gotta trust me, all right? I trust you. Because I'm getting a better job. Ooh, child. Let me see if I can find you an application for our internship. Yeah. Did mom leave because of me? Mom left because of mom, and you didn't have anything to do with that. There's no salary. No. I was not aware of that. My circumstances have changed some. Dad, where are we going? I don't know. Last year, we had an intern score on 90% on the written exam. He wasn't chosen. It's not a simple pass-fail. You're not quitting on this yet, are you? Don't ever let somebody tell you you can't do something. Yeah. Not even me. All right? All right. Jay says you're pretty determined. Where are you going? Go to the hospital. I'm in a competitive internship at Dean Witter. He said you're smart. This is impossible. I can do it. No, you can't. No one can. That is wrong. You got a dream, you got to protect it. People can't do something themselves. They want to tell you you can't do it. You want something, go get it. Period. Now I can tell you, that's how I first came to know who Chris Gardner was through that movie. After seeing that movie, I was so interested that I bought the book. But it wasn't until a half a dozen years ago when I met the man and we became friends that he began to change my life in ways that words could never describe. Chris Gardner is the embodiment of pragmatic wisdom wrapped up in contagious enthusiasm. And he's dedicated his life to empowering others and to inspire them to dream big. As great an actor as Will Smith is, I can assure you the real Chris Gardner is even better in person. Said another way, the man is bigger than the myth. At this moment, I'd like to transition over to Chris to hear his opening comments. Hi, I'm Chris Gardner. We've never met, but I know something very important about you. You would really like to be back at school right now. At this point, you miss your friends, you miss your teachers, you miss your professors. I say that with such confidence because of a conversation that I had at the beginning of this pandemic and lockdown with my 13-year-old granddaughter who said to me, Papa, I want my life back. <laughs> Trust me, we all do. No one alive today can say that they've ever seen, experienced, or imagined what we're all living through right now. I don't know about you, but I feel like someone just took two Will Smith movies, I Am Legend and The Pursuit of Happiness and put them into a blender. At the beginning of this pandemic, I was trying to explain to my granddaughter where we all are right now. And the best analogy that I could come up with was that of an earthquake. An earthquake that shook the entire planet at the same time. This is where we've all had to make a hard pivot. 
and a hard pivot being defined as something that you would have never chosen, but you still got to make it work. Mm. Probably, like a lot of you, I've gotten experience in making hard pivots my entire life. I get to check a lot of boxes. Abandoned child, foster care, mom in prison, never met my father, domestic violence survivor, sexual assault survivor, never went to college, veteran, single parent, homeless, entrepreneur, and black. And I said black last because I got this free. <laughs> this is the original packaging right here. My point is this, all of those previous hard pivots that we've all had to make have prepared us to go forward. I was asked last year by a major business journalist if change was coming to America. My response was, change is already here. I've seen change coming for some time now. I look back on 2020 and I see the faces of young people all across America and indeed around the world peacefully protesting and demonstrating their fears, their pains, their frustrations. And let's be clear, I am not talking about the rioting. I'm against rioting, whether it's the people, the police, or politicians that incite them. I'm talking about the peaceful protests. And I saw something, the youth. And I said to myself, wow, man, let's just look back 20 years. If you draw a timeline, the faces of those young people in their early 20s, probably like some of you, you were conceived in a storm, meaning the year 1999, your parents, your grandparents, and I, we were all freaked out about something called Y2K. You might need to Google that. It turned out to be a non-event, but at that point in time, the fear was everything that used technology, a microprocessor or technology to function was going to fail. The banks were going to collapse. The utilities were going to fail. All government documents and records were going to be lost forever. It turned out to be a non-event, but the fear at that time was real. The children born in the year 2000, just as they were learning how to walk, 2001, what happens? 9-11. Fast forward on that timeline, seven years, what happens? The global financial crises. Fast forward 12 years, what happens? Politics, polarization, and a pandemic. What's the one constant in that timeline? Big, dramatic, frightening change. Change is here to stay. I will submit to you, there's never been a generation better prepared to embrace, create, or demand change than just this generation right here. Just look at that timeline. Change is in their DNA. I'll tell you another place that I've seen change that gives me tremendous hope for the future of our country. Prior to the pandemic, I was in the process of doing a tour that was going to have me speak at 100 high schools and middle schools all across America. And when I say all across America, man, I mean that literally. I'm talking Fitchburg, Massachusetts, Mentor, Ohio, Fairmont, Minnesota, Carbondale, Illinois, Biloxi, Mississippi, before that thing was done, I was going to be singing that old Johnny Cash tune, I've been everywhere. The pandemic forced us to shut it down and make the hard pivot from doing live presentations to using technology. As a result of that, we've raised a bar. We blew through that number of 100 schools. Right now, we're looking to do 1,000 schools all across America right now. That is what gives me hope for the future. Because when I'm with these young people, I see the future. I've shaken hands with the future. I've laughed with the future. I have hugged the future. And let me tell you something. Some of us may be less than impressed with some of the players that we've seen take the field recently, but I'm here to tell you in America, the bench is deep. And they're coming. 
the film The Pursuit of Happiness is probably more relevant today than it was when it was initially released. I say that because of this. Think about it. The film was released in December of 2006. January 2007, economists started asking, is the U.S. economy going into a recession? Spring of 2008 is officially acknowledged as the beginning of the global financial crises. My point is, all those young people who went away to college in 2008 saying, yes, we can, that came out four years later saying, what the? I did everything I was told to do. I went to school. I got good grades, I graduated, but now the world has changed so much, I've got little to no opportunity to work in the business or industry that I want to be in. I got $100,000 in student loan debt, and now I've got to move back in the house with mom and dad, if they haven't lost the house. The young people that I'm talking to today, they were their younger brothers and sisters, and they were watching and they saw how things did not work out like my big brother or my big sister thought they were going to, and I've got to think about things differently. What I'm doing right now in public education is the largest investment that I'll ever make in my 35-year career on Wall Street, and I will not make a dime. I'm making a huge alternative investment in human capital. This is not about do good, feel good, we are the world. This is about job readiness, workforce preparation, and again, an alternative investment in human capital. And when I'm with young people, I share with them the most important and the greatest gift that I ever got in my life, which was permission to dream. And I thank God every day. I had one of those old fashioned mothers who told me I could do or be anything and I believed it. It's very important I share with you what she did not say. She did not say that you could have anything. She did not say that you could buy anything. She did not say that you're guaranteed, assured, older, entitled to anything. She said you could do or be anything. And for me, that was an even bigger statement because if you could do or be anything, all of these other things will come. That right there, permission to dream, if I could give it to everyone in America, I would. And actually, I choose to right now. You know why? Because I am the CEO of happiness, and I love my job. Until I see you in person, peace, power, and prayers. Ah, uh, Chris. Oh, Brad. I love that. I love that, my friend. And I'm going to get to you and Shelly in a minute. But what I want to do at this moment is I just want to reflect on two things you shared. One thing you talked about was this notion of a pivot. And we use that language in the Silicon Valley. And a pivot is taking a current set of circumstances and translating them into bigger opportunity. And that example of you being on the road to see 100 schools and then turning it into 1,000 schools through elect electronic technology like Zoom is a great example. Mm. And then the second thing is, I love this notion of human capital and investing in human capital, the greatest investment you'll ever make in your career. And it reminds me of a quote that I love, that all of us should aspire to plant trees under whose shade we will never sit, but others will be able to benefit from that shade. And that's the chapter that you're in. I know that's the chapter I'm in. And with that, I'd also like to bring Shelly to the screen as well, please, because I am excited to kick off this panel at this moment and to have both of you here. And since Chris, you just finished up with that rousing speech, I'm gonna start with you first. Mm. Obviously, this last year has tested all of us. It has been the amazing amplifier for some. It's been the unbelievably tough discriminator for others. It's created a disproportionate impact on so many different people, so many different communities. And I guess I wanna ask you straight up, is the American dream still possible for all of us? Well, when I talk about that, Brad, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked. When I talk about the American dream, I want to be very clear. The definition that I refer to was given to me by my mom, who said you could do or be anything. I got to stress again, she did not say you could have anything. She did not say you could buy anything. She did not say you're guaranteed or sure older entitled to anything. She said you could do 
or be anything. And for me, Brad, that was an even bigger statement. And when I talk to young people today, that's the reference point I have to use when I talk about the American dream. But I stress to young people today, Brad, <clears throat> the biggest change in the American dream is that it's gone global. Mm -hmm. And when I'm with young people, I'm stressing to them, you got to keep in mind that because of globalization and technology, the people that you're now competing with are not in your classroom. Because of globalization and technology, the people that you're competing with are someplace all around the world. And while you are off being young, enjoying yourself as you're perfectly entitled to do, you got to know this, the people you're competing with are someplace grinding. They're practicing, they're networking, they're rehearsing, they're researching, and that's going to make the difference between who signs the front of the check and who signs the back of the check. I love that, right? Chris. And when you put it to them like that, Brad, you can see the lights come on. Whoa. Yes. Sure. I never thought of it like that. <laughs> I love it. Well, you know, I'm going to take that. And I'm going to turn over to Shelly and ask you, Shelly, you gave us a little snippet of your journey, your life, which is captured so amazingly in your book, Unapologetically Ambitious. But you were dealt a lot of challenges early on at a young, young age, and you overcame those challenges. So what motivated you and what were one or two lessons you learned early in life that you think put you on the right path? Mm -hmm. What motivated me? I wanted to figure out how I could afford to keep the thermostat at 72 degrees. <laughs> I mean, you know, at a very fundamental level, in my family, money was tight. And our thermostat on the East Coast never went above 68. Now it could be below 68, but it never went above 68. And I was just like, how much money do I need to earn to keep the house warm? <laughs> so at a very fundamental level, that was one. But the other thing that motivated me was frankly, people didn't expect much from me. And they, I wasn't very encouraged. And I just never felt much respect, right? As a person, I was kind of there, but I didn't get respect. And honestly, the other thing that motivated me is I just wanted to show that, hey, I I'm capable. I wanted to show that I, I can actually do things and I wanted to be respected. So those two things, you know, very fundamental, <laughs> right? And then um, very personal uh, was really what drove me to be able to say, I can do it and I'll show you. Um, with regards to lessons learned, you know, um, a couple, one was early. Uh, I was in Girl Scouts. So Girl Scouts, my parents were big believers in scouting and the benefits of, you know, leadership, et cetera. And here I am in Girl Scouts and I think I'm in middle school and there's a jamboree that's coming. And jamboree is when they bring all the scouting troops together from the same region and have an event. And they were going to have a representative from each troop that was going to be kind of the, there for the leadership group of the jamboree. And, oh, that's what I wanted, right? I wanted to be the representative and I worked hard and I volunteered, I did all kinds of things. And then they picked the person and it wasn't me. And I went home and told my mom, I was real disappointed. You know, I didn't get picked for that. And she said to me, well, Shelly, who knew you wanted to be picked? And I said, well, what do you mean? Did you ever tell anybody you actually wanted to do that? And I said, well, no, mom. I just thought, you know, I worked hard and I volunteered and I was just trying to be the best scout. I thought they would just pick me. So what I learned was hope is not a strategy. It's not a strategy. You actually have to let people know what you want to do. Um, and then the second big lesson I learned was the important, importance of focus. So I mentioned in my talk, you know, we grew up, money was really tight. I mean, mom made our clothes because fabric was cheaper than buying things. Well, in order to make clothes for four children and herself, she was at the sewing machine every single day. She also did all the things that somebody who keeps the house does we never ate out. So mom, everything was homemade food, homemade meals, and we had a homemade dessert every night. So mom was, went to bed after I went to bed and she was up before I was up. And I'm, you know, so here I'm in the kitchen. It's my turn to clean the kitchen. I'm washing the pie plate. Mom had made a pie. And I was reflecting on, she made a pie and everybody cut it up. And she was the last person to take a piece. Well, you know, you kids, you grab for the biggest piece. And I'm like, gosh, mom does all this work. She doesn't get any sleep. She bakes the pie and she gets the smallest piece. I'm like, I, I, no, I went and told her, I said, mom, I am not having kids. I decided I am not willing to work as hard as you work for the smallest piece of pie. And she was like, Shelly, sit down. And she said, 
and, and I'll never forget it. It framed my whole outlook on life. She said, Shelly, I do not care about that pie. She said, I have everything that I care about. The key is for you to decide what you care about and then focus on getting that and forget about the rest. Wow. So focus, focus, and hope is not a strategy. And those two things have really shaped how I approach the strategic nature, if you will, of my career and my life. Yeah, Shelly, what amazing stories. And to borrow from Chris, you know, our original packaging may look different, mm. but our stories, our mm. mothers, mm. the things that we've all kind of come through, including me, as I mentioned to you, you know this, Shelly, very well, but I graduated out of West Virginia from Marshall University and went into my professional career. And I had a boss who thought I needed to go to New York and get a vocal coach to get rid of my Southern accent or my West Virginia twang because he felt it wouldn't serve me well in my career. I was underestimated as well. And like you, I found the ability to focus and to turn it into a plan and to execute. So it's amazing. Chris, I want to go to you because talking about family and the impact of mothers, you often share a quote which is when it comes to my family, there will be no more firsts. Mm. What does that mean? Man, you know what? I, first of all, let me say this, not to get distracted. I think that all mothers, there's a secret school that all mothers go to because they all wound up telling us pretty much the same things. Brad, I can start off right now and say, uh, moms say this thing about you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them can't drink. Can't make them drink. Right? Okay. Uh, you don't miss your water till your well runs dry. Yeah. Don't burn that bridge. You got to come back that way. All right. They all go to a secret school, man, just for moms. <laughs> and the, the, this whole idea, I, I just lost my train of thought, Brad. What was that question? Again? That, it's okay, Chris. That's why we're here to talk. I'm I asking hear my mom this was, notion my, of my when it comes to family, no more first. No more first myself and my siblings, the first generation that never picked cotton in the history of my family. My children, first generation to ever attend and graduate from college and universities. For my granddaughter, Brad, there will be no more first. There are no more first. For her, there's only now and next. We did all the other stuff is done. Right? We have raised the bar and there are no more first for us, not in my family. No, sir. Wow. All the cycles have been broken. And that is the hope that every one of us has in front of us and the opportunity we have if we seize the moment and we actually put that plan in place and we execute. And Shelly, speaking of first, you graduated from a university that is a very reputable school and your first job you chose was sales. Why did you choose sales? <laughs> You're right, Brad. I actually got a, a lot of people were like, what? What? You're going to become a salesperson? What? Everybody in our, you know, our group, we should be going to become investment bankers and P&G product managers, international financial analysts, and you're going to go sell computers? Well, remember I talked about, you know, thinking about the plan? I wanted to be a CEO and I wanted to do it in tech because it was a growing industry. And so I did the research. And IBM at the time was the leading company. So I said, great, I'm gonna join IBM and become CEO of IBM. And every single CEO started out in sales. I didn't know why, but obviously that had to be the path to power, right? So I said, all right, I need to do sales. So I picked it, not because I loved sales. I picked it because I thought it was a skill set and experience that was critical for what I wanted to do later. So I started out in sales. And I will tell you to this day, to this day, I tell people, everyone should do a stint in sales. I learned more in sales <clears throat> by carrying quota than I learned in frankly any other job for that period of time. Because you learn, number one, no doesn't mean no. All that no means is not now. It means something's not right, right? Timing's not right. <clears throat> Your skill sets aren't right. The value proposition's not right. The, I mean, something is not right. So all no means is not now, which gives you the opportunity to figure out, okay, why not now? And when you find out the why not now, that's the roadmap to how to get a yes. And I have used that strategy throughout my entire career. So when people say no, I'm like, yes, because that gives me the chance to ask the most powerful question, which is why not? And when I get the why not, 
That's the roadmap, whether that's for a promotion, whether that's for a new job, whether that's for more money, whether that's for whatever it is. I love getting no's because it's clarity. If you don't ask the question, you have no idea why something's not happening. So sales, absolutely. Learn how to qualify. You learn how to connect with people. You learn how to actually create shared wins. You, I mean, there's just so much there. So sales was a key foundation element for me. Hey, Brad, can I add one thing to, to Shelly's comments about sales? Absolutely. I want to this real clear, as, as clear as possible. Nobody else at a business has a job until a salesperson sells something. Right, absolutely right. We don't need a manager. We don't need administrators. We don't need compliance. We don't need anything until somebody writes a ticket. And I'll say for the viewing audience, you got three people on this screen, all of who started their career in sales, including me. <laughs> Let's go. That's right. Hey, Chris, <laughs> let, let me ask you on this notion. We also know the element of sales is not only uncovering a problem, overcoming objections, as Shelly talked about, but helping people see the art of the possible and even a better opportunity if they buy into the solution. You've written a new book, Permission to Dream. I was talking to you about it before this call, and quite candidly, it had me in tears multiple times and bursting out in laughter multiple times, but left me with clear eyes and a full heart when I was done. Why did you choose to name this book Permission to Dream? Because, Brad, that was the most important and greatest gift I ever got in my life. Mm -hmm. Having a mother who told me I could do or be anything, that permission to dream. And if I could right now, Brad, I would like to give that same permission to everybody in America and indeed all around the world because dreams don't have borders. But right now here in our country, there's probably never been a greater need or a better time to give ourselves permission to dream. And I will say this, right now at this moment in time, we would probably all be giving ourselves permission to dream of some very, very basic things. I would love to be able to be with my family again. Hmm? Yeah, I would dream of, Brett, I have not seen my granddaughter in one year. And I got to tell you, it breaks my heart every day. You can do all this Zoom stuff, FaceTime and all that. Ain't nothing going to replace grabbing your child. All right? Makes me think back, and not to be long-winded about this, but uh, went to the gym a couple of months ago. Kind of had a tough day. But I saw this little boy, Shelly. He was riding his bicycle through the parking lot. And because of the lockdown, he couldn't go anywhere. So he just ride around the parking lot like he was in the Tour de France. And I stopped him for a second. And I said, Brad, I said to him, young man, if you could go anywhere in the world on that bicycle right now, where would you go? He thought about a moment and he said, you know what? I would ride to Massachusetts to see my grandparents. Wow. My granddaughter lives in Massachusetts. Man, I almost cried. Mm -hmm. But this whole idea right now, permission to dream could also be the part where we begin to heal as a country. I can dream of getting mine and protecting mine without taking away from you and yours. Mm -hmm. That can't happen. So this whole idea of permission to dream um, couldn't be a more timely concept, Brad. And um, Shelly, I, I haven't gotten a copy to you, but uh, I'll get your address. I'll get it to you as soon as possible. Oh, thank you. Well, Chris, and maybe that young man will let you sit on the back of his bike and you can both go to Massachusetts. And see <laughs> you know what the you funny know. thing was? I pretty much threw him the keys to my truck and said, here, you can drive. <laughs> he, threw it back, it. Man. he says i'm only 12 i can't drive but i said son that's all right you'll figure it out along the way <laughs> and that's kind of where we are right now brad shelly we've had to figure some of this out along the way absolutely right absolutely. Yes. we're in the space where no one has ever been but i will add this the skills that we've acquired in this this force this hard pivot here these skills are going to be in our toolbox for a long time mm -hmm. because this is going to happen again, guys. I know. We just don't know his name. Yes. It's going to happen again. Yes.
Well said, Chris. Well said. And you know, with that, I'm going to ask each of you one last question, then I want to open it up to the viewing audience. So if you have questions, make sure you submit them in the Q&A function and we'll, make, we'll get to your questions. But Shelly, I'll start with you. You had a plan. You talked to a counselor. You figured out you wanted to run a club. Those become companies. You wanted to be a CEO. You know, a lot of people start out with plans like that and they don't get there. What do you think you did that was different that you would want to make sure the viewing audience had the opportunity to learn from? Mm. Now, this is a great question because you're right, Brad. A lot of people set goals and some people will actually take the time to put a plan in place to achieve the goals. But what I found is very few people make decisions every day consistent with their plans. And that's where the real power is on executing the plan. And when I talk about making decisions, what that means is I assumed all along the way that my plan was going to happen. I assumed the plan was going to happen. And therefore, I made decisions assuming that what I wanted to happen was going to happen so I could get prepared for it. Let me, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. One of the things in my plan was I wanted to work for IBM, right? Become a CEO. I'm in college. I also wanted to get married and I wanted to have kids. And ideally, I'd like to get married early so I could have kids early. So that's my plan. So I just assumed that was going to happen. All right. Okay. So I'm 19 years old. I have no boyfriend at the time, <laughs> but just, to, just to say, and I need a new winter coat. So I go to the mall, actually the outlet mall, right? And I buy a coat. Now, how long should a good coat last, right? I don't have a whole lot of money. Well, a good coat, I think should last like what, seven, eight years? I mean, it should last a long time. So if my plan works out, I'll be pregnant when I have this coat. So I come back with this brand new coat I bought, a swing coat, double-breasted swing coat. When you turn around, it actually flares. And my roommate was like, well, Shelly, it's a nice coat, but not very stylish. You know, fitted coats, pea coats were in style then. And I said, I know, but I wanted to be able to wear it when I'm pregnant. And she looked at me like I was nuts. Shelly, you don't even have a boyfriend. I said, well, I know, but you know, I want to be married and pregnant in my 20s. So within eight years, you know, I should be pregnant. So why, is, why would I buy a coat that I couldn't wear? And that way, every time I wear this coat, I'm thinking about my plan. Well, guess what? I wore the coat when I was pregnant with both my kids. Wow. So what, you know, making decisions consistent with the plan, it sets you up. I didn't have to buy a new coat, so I probably saved, you know, a couple hundred bucks. But the big thing was every time I put it on, every time I put it on, I was focused on what is it I'm trying to do and how do I go get there? And I did that every step of the way. Now, plans don't always happen. I mean, trust me, no, they don't always go according to plan, but it doesn't matter. By assuming that it does, you're building skills, you're putting, think of it as chits in the bank, right? Working towards what it is that you ultimately want to happen. So it all becomes valuable. You might just use it in a different way. Incredible. What a wonderful story and what a great example of what differentiates those who have a strategy of hope versus those who have a deliberate plan and they make conscious choices every day in support of that plan. Chris, I'll wrap up with you. Then we're going to take the audience questions. The question to you is you have built an amazing reservoir of experience and wisdom. It shows up in books. It shows up in movies. If you could time travel back to your 17 year old self and give yourself a piece of advice, what would that advice be? What would the 67-year-old me say to the 17-year-old me? <laughs> I wasn't going to out your age, my friend, but you no, can go ahead and no, put it out there. No, I, look, I own every moment of this. I earned this, sir. <laughs> I paid for this. <laughs> All right. <laughs> what would the 67-year-old me say to the 17-year-old me? I told you so. Oh. I told you so. All you have to do is do this and this and this and this. And not unlike Shelly, um, this idea of having a plan, I take it a little bit step, uh, further. I talk about what is plan A. Mm. And the best plan A's all have something I call the C5 complex. Your plan A has got to be clear, concise, compelling, consistent, and committed. Just like Shelly talked about wearing that coat, mm -hmm. right? Clear, concise, compelling, consistent, and committed. And when you're talking about doing something you're truly passionate about, there is no plan B. Mm -hmm. Plan B sucks. 
<laughs> hey, there's no plan B. Uh, you know, give uh, your plan B to somebody that you don't like for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking plan A's and a C5 commitment. Next <laughs> All right. Well, with that, Chris and Shelly, we're going to open it up and I'll turn it over to Dr. Langton, who can help us curate the questions. And we'll hear from the audience. And hopefully the questions are directed to someone in particular. And if not, we'll just open it up to others and let them answer. Thank you, Brad, and thank you, Chris and Shelley, for a really wonderful discussion. Uh, we have record numbers of questions in the chat function, and um, we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. The first question is, I just recently got promoted to manager at Pepsi. What is the best way to move up in the company fast? Shelley, it wasn't okay, I'll start with Shelley, and then I'll ask Chris if he has anything he wants to add. Sure. So the best way is, first of all, make sure you understand what success looks like. You know, don't go just by the job description. Ask your new manager, right? What does success look like? And use those words because you'll typically, I found that I typically heard other things beyond just what the role of the job was. And that way, you know what it is that you actually need to do and accomplish. So that's one. Uh, two, make sure that People actually know what you do. You know, don't, don't just put your head down, do the work, and then hope people notice you. Remember that Girl Scout Jamboree? You have to let people know what you aspire to. And you, can, you don't have to walk around saying, oh, one day I want to run the place. No, nobody wants people like that. But what you can do is ask people who are around you in, in higher level jobs to say, one day I aspire to be a whatever, vice president of XYZ, right? Do you think I have the potential? Right now, when you've told them, but you've told them in a way in which you're actually asking for advice, people are more willing to answer that. And then you can ask them for future advice. What do you think I need to do? So anyway, there's lots of things. And by the way, the book has a lot of this stuff in it, yeah. but those would be my quick things. Those are great. Chris, anything you would add to that amazing set of uh, wisdom that Shelly just shared? Well, to the person that just asked that question about working at Pepsi, I would say you need to talk to Brad Smith. <laughs> well, you started at Pepsi, right? I did start at Pepsi. It's an Worked amazing. Worked out okay company. for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. They they can call me and do everything opposite of me, and you'll have a great <laughs> career. <laughs> That's great. All right. Well, we'll go to the next question, Doctor Langton. Okay. The next question. This one is for Shelly. It reads: Who was the first person to open a door for you for your first management role? What book and what book are you currently reading? Ah, so the first person to open the door was actually, his name was Kurt Uline, hired me to be, well, I didn't hire me, he actually recommended me. I worked for him directly and there was a management position open and he was the one that actually endorsed and recommended me for that position. Um, so that would be the first person. And with regards to what book I'm currently reading, um, I, I'm actually, I have, I have several that are kind of in the queue. Um, it's like, I, I read in terms of here, here are a number of things that are going on, but let's see, which one would I tell you? I would tell you um, how um, ask for, it's basically how to ask for what you want, Wayne Baker. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna get the exact title wrong because I read Kindles, um, it. but it's by Wayne Baker and it's basically called something, ask for what you want. That's close to the title. Perfect, <laughs> all right, thank you. All right, our next question is, in these stories, we've noted that proximity to opportunity has been a common theme, be it Wall Street or Silicon Valley. To that end, how can someone in West Virginia who is devoted to the state and its progress expect to create opportunity here? Are we to rely on the hope that large companies move to employ us, or are we going to have to abandon our state? And that's open to anyone. I'm gonna take that one. Create the future that you want. 75% of net new jobs are created by startups and we have a real opportunity in West Virginia to create the next Amazon, the next Intuit, the next metric stream, all these companies that you hear about. 
And the second thing is companies are coming to you now through remote work. And we have an exciting set of initiatives that'll be happening where people will be able to participate in these companies and be a part of the Silicon Valley or Wall Street without ever leaving the beautiful mountains of West Virginia. Going into the pandemic, it was estimated 23% of all jobs in the S&P 500 were allowed to work anywhere they wanted. And now that number is closer to 37%, according to some research done by Upwork. So know that you have an opportunity to participate in this next chapter by either working for a company that allows remote work or by creating your own company as an entrepreneur. And if you ever do leave, I will assure you as one person's example here, your heart will never leave and someday you'll come home. Great. Okay. This question is for everyone as well. It is, what is the biggest mistake you have ever made? Can I direct that to Chris first since Shelly took the last Whoa. one? Okay. Whoa. Okay. Are we talking business or personal? All the above. Are we talking recent or historical? Hey, buddy, <laughs> you already shared your chronological age. You can hey, go as far I've back as you all want. Of them. I've made every mistake that you can possibly make, but I've learned from all of them. And one of the things that I've learned in the process is forget the mistake, remember the lesson. Yes. What awesome. did you learn so that you don't make that same mistake again? Yeah. That's how I got my education. And uh, I, I can't stress enough. We probably learn more from failures and mistakes than we do successes. Sometimes we, we have a success and we just think, okay, all right, I can just replicate that automatically. It doesn't always happen that way. Uh, it's a, this thing called nonlinear progression. It's not always A, B, C, one, two, three. There's some steps in between that. So every mistake that could be made, I've learned from, and that's put me in this position right now that um, I'm probably, my mindset right now, says everything before this was practice, I finally figured out what it is and how it's supposed to be working. Ah, everything awesome. before that was practice. I love it. How about you, Shelly? Biggest mistake. Hmm. You know, I'll share one in terms of just early, early in my career. Um, there was something happening in the, the office or was getting ready to happen in the office that was going to affect people in terms of roles and jobs and, and everything else. And my, my boss confided in me and it was like, but don't tell, you know, don't tell anybody. But there was one person in particular that was really going to be impacted, you know, by this. And I was like, gosh, okay. So my personal values, right. In terms of this is my boss, first of all, shouldn't tell, shouldn't have told me. It's terrible to put me in that kind of position to tell me something that I shouldn't know because they needed to get off their chest and actually affects, you know, in terms of affects somebody else. Um, and so ultimately I, I kept, if you will, I kept that confidence and I didn't say anything. The person that I was worried about, everything happened as I expected. Um, and it was not a good thing. I will tell you hindsight when I say, you know, mistake that I made is when my boss said, I told, you know, I told you this and that they told me, I, you know, don't tell anybody. I should have followed my own values, which I should have told them. I appreciate the fact that you told me, but it was unfair to tell me and put me in a position where someone who's very close to me is going to be impacted and not allow me to do anything about it. So you should tell that person. I should have actually done something versus just followed that rule. I think it's really important. One thing that I learned from that and going forward, I don't do things that go against my values because I feel awful. Yeah. I feel awful. And there's nothing I can do to feel better about those things. So after doing that once, I should have handled that differently. I don't do things that go against my values. Great. Full stop. Great lesson. And, and for me, mine's very simple. My mother said it to me when I was a kid. I'm made entirely of flaws stitched together with good intentions. So I am full of mistakes, but I get up every day, dust myself off and try hard again. So Dr. Langton, let's go to uh, the next question, please. All right. The next question is... I tell young people all the time that entrepreneurship is about solving problems. What problems are companies looking for in the next generation of leaders um, for them to solve? Mm -hmm. So what should be their 
um, problem solving points. Okay. Hmm. Shelly, would you yeah, like to no, start? That's, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, I would tell you, you know, what I look for in, in leaders are leaders who are able, frankly, not to solve all the problems themselves, but are able to build teams that collectively can get problems solved. Because if you end up with an organization and you really count on the individual leader to solve all the problems, then the people underneath them and the other folks in their teams, they don't get to grow. And I fundamentally believe that a leader's job at the end of the day is to build more leaders because an organization and a company cannot grow and scale if you don't have enough leadership to be able to cover and drive all the activities that need to happen. So that's what I would say. Great. Chris, did you have something you would put out there? I would take that question in another direction. Um, one of the things that I'm talking with young people about right now, Brad, is uh, the importance of not disengaging from your education, your schooling, or teachers right now. Mm -hmm. This is the time to do school like a boss. B-O-S-S. -S. You've got to be bold, opportunistic, strategic, and straight. Bold. The biggest bosses in any business or industry that you can think of at some point did say, I need help. That's a bold statement. Opportunistic. The space that we're in right now, having to learn remotely, one day you might have to work remotely. But before you can do that, you're going to have to interview and network remotely. So this is an opportunity to master the new skill set that you've got to demonstrate just to get in the game. Strategic. Keep your focus on your long game. We are playing chess, not checkers. As straight, it's never going to change. The quickest way from A to B is a straight line. You cannot allow yourself to be distracted, but most importantly, you cannot be a distraction to yourself. Love it. That's wow. what I think needs to be kind of hammered here. Well, what an amazing leader teacher both of you are. Passing on the wisdom, planting trees under whose shade you may not sit, mm -hmm. but someone else is going to enjoy a lifetime mm -hmm. of lessons. Mm -hmm. Dr. Langton, we have time for one more. Hey, this question is about COVID-19. It says, for those of us graduating in the spring of 2021, what advice would you give us looking for a job while we're still in this pandem pandemic? cold calling to companies or trying to just build our resumes till something sticks? Ah, great question. Actually, Listen I'm going to pick the option. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Shelly. No, you can go. It's great. Okay. I was going to say, I'm going to pick the option that actually wasn't listed. <laughs> and that is, it's really important to network. And you know what, when I say that, a lot of people, especially students are like, but I don't have a network yet. Right? How do we network if I don't have a network? Guess what? Everybody has a network. Your network are just people you know. So whether they are classmates or parents of friends or neighbors or people who go to your church or they are people you work out with in the gym, you're your professors, right? They're the student advisors. I mean, you if you literally think about it, you actually know and touch a lot of people. So as you think about the job market and you decide what area or what focus you wanna have, start telling people and asking for their advice. Just like I said, you know, one day I'd aspire to VP, fine, you're in school. I want to actually build a career in whatever it is, in technology, in oil and gas, and da-da-da-da. Ask everybody you touch, right? What do you think? Is there anyone that you know that I should talk to, right? So that way you get to use their network. Um, but I would encourage you networking. All research shows that networking has the biggest impact on your ability to actually get roles and get jobs. And you have a wonderful, amazing opportunity while you're at Marshall to leverage actually the network and support that the university and all the members of the university actually bring. Wonderful. Wonderful advice. Chris? I would go again, take it a step further than Shelley. Um, I'm probably the only person on this call old enough to remember that old song we used to sing in elementary school called the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, okay? That song was written by Sir William Davis in 1795, reading, writing, arithmetic. My point is there's a new three R's and the new three R's are the rep, the rap, and the Rolodex. 
You've got to have a reputation for excellence in your business and your personal affairs. The wrap, you've got to be able to communicate. You can have the best goods, services, or products in the world, but if you cannot communicate it, you will never sell anything. And that last part, the Rolodex, some of you might need to Google that. But before there was the, the smartphone, there was this big paper thing, the Rolodex, going to Shelley's point, relationships. It's always going to come down to who's created, nurtured, and invested the most in relationships. We're going into some spaces where everybody is good. There's this much difference between you and the next person. The person who's going to get the opportunity is who's invested and created the best relationships. It's not going to change. I'm not it. saying it's fair, but it's real. And you've got just as many opportunities to create those relationships as anybody else. Here, here. I'll tell you what, I love that. And I will echo the relationships and the networking and tell you Marshall University has an amazing reputation. You have great professors, great deans, great alumni, and they're all over. And all you have to do is send an email, ask a question, as Shelly said, and you're going to find someone who knows someone and they can help you in the journey. So with that, it is my privilege to bring to a close today the third CEO panel with two amazing speakers, Shelly Archambault, who is the exemplar of unapologetically ambitious, had a very clear goal, had a plan, and made every conscious decision throughout her life to make that plan a reality. And she is a living example of how that works. And then Chris Gardner, pursuit of happiness, permission to dream, he is legend. He is the person that so many turn to to say, how do you make it happen? How do you overcome so many seemingly insurmountable obstacles and throughout it all have such an upbeat attitude and a willingness to give back to others. These are examples that I think we can all learn from. I certainly have benefited from them. It is a treasure to call them my friends. And it is a privilege to be from West Virginia and to be a Marshall University alumni. I am because we are. Stay strong, stay healthy, and we will look forward to seeing you again at the next CEO panel. Take care, everyone.